next person speaks, I want to remind everybody to like and subscribe this video. We desperately need help. I algorithm to get not, to 500 subscribers. We're so yeah. close. Yes, we don't exist. If you have under 500 subscribers on YouTube, you, you don't exist. Like I said in an, an earlier ep episode. And I've been um, listening to ghosts. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, 500. We're at 444. So I once, will we, once, we, once we start hitting magical numbers, it's like uh, mm -hmm. the hype's got to start, man. We're getting there. So yes. if you can, please like and subscribe and, and watch at least like 15, 20 minutes of the video so it'll register as a view. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we're going to go on to Kaylin now. <laughs> All right. Uh, so my second pick for this, um, I'm going to go ahead and talk about this one because I want to make sure that I cover it. Um, so my second pick is Quilombo, uh, which is a Brazilian film from 1984. Um, so this one is a drama. It's a historic uh, period piece kind of film, um, and it takes place in... Uh, early on in the colonial history of South America, uh, where the Portuguese have come and colonized what is now Brazil. Um, the film starts off with kind of a bit of a, you know, quick history lesson at the beginning. They've got the stuff on the screen and they're like, you know, 1500 is when the first um, enslaved Africans were brought to this hemisphere. Um, and then, you know, within the next like 100 years or so, all the stuff happened. Uh, so what happens with this film is it's about the founding of a community called Palmares. Um, and this is a community of um, formerly enslaved mm -hmm. African folks who led a revolt against the Portuguese and managed to escape. Um, so they find they found their own community in the mountains. Um, it's this like paradise. It's very beautiful. Everything's lush. There's lots of fruit. There's plenty to eat. Um, they're very, it's a very, it's a place that's very rich in resources. It's absolutely incredible. And the thing that's really important about this film is one, the history that's depicted is super, super important. A lot of people actually compare this one to the woman King, which I talked about in a previous episode when we were talking about women warriors, love that film very much. I know that it has its issues, but I do genuinely really love it. This one gets compared to that one a lot, uh, because it's also about, kind of the history of the transatlantic slave trade, although this one is set in Brazil rather than set in Africa. So in The Woman King, you have the kingdom of Dahomey, and then here you've got once people actually are brought to the Americas. Um, something that the film handles very, very well and that it's very famous for is the way that they talk about race and the way that they talk about culture. Um, there's a lot of very good representation of um, the spirituality of West African cultures. So uh, something that comes up in a lot of Latin American films are the Orishas, which are these kind of um, spirit deities that a lot of these cultures um, believed in and worshipped. And then in, uh, in South America and in the Caribbean as well, you see this kind of cultural religious syncretism where there's a blending of those African traditions and Christianity and also native, like indigenous um, beliefs, you know, from people who were from this part of the world. Uh, and you see a lot of that in this film and it is really, really cool how it's depicted. Yeah, cool. um, another thing that's very important is that you have the characters speaking very candidly about the fact that they're from all these different cultures it's not like they're one people who were brought over and then you know like starting over on a new continent it's that you've got people who speak all these different languages they have all these different traditions uh early on in the film there's someone who's like you know please speak the white man's language so we can all understand each other they're like speak portuguese we all know portuguese we don't know all of these different languages back from our african roots um and it's interesting how you see that like the the tools of the colonizers and the people who are doing the enslavement um are actually like used by the people who have been oppressed in order to create this new culture together that blends all of their cultures but they also have the distinct mm. cultures mm. uh so once they found this place um palmares um you you even see at one point like once they've been kind of established the film takes place over a few decades it kind of tracks the progress of 
the um, of the revolt of them um, going to this place, creating this place to live, um, and all of that. Uh, there's there's kind of different villages within that, and they are you know they each have their own leader, and then there's this one guy who is kind of the leader of all of them. Um, actually, very similar to in um, in Wakanda and Black Panther. Um, where you've got like, you know, everybody has their own culture and their own group, but then they're all under the right. king of Wakanda who kind of like, you know, uh, kind of facilitates all of those groups coming together when they need to. Um, so you see all of this depiction of all these different cultures coming together, um, and they have this common goal of, you know, securing their freedom and preserving their freedom. And at the same time during all of this, there's the uh, Luso-Dutch war going on. So between Portugal and um, and the Dutch, I guess at that point it would have been um, Holland, I think. Um, not Never Netherlands yet, I believe. It's changed um, names a lot. <laughs> it does. And that's where my ancestors are from. And I really should know this, but I don't. Oh. Um, <laughs> yeah. uh, so... Uh, so, you know, there's there's this whole thing where um, there's all these different conflicts going on and these people are just trying to live and and have that freedom. And that gets emphasized over and over and over again. And there's different approaches to how they should go about this. Um, you know, not everybody's going to agree all the time. They generally follow this one guy, Abiola, um, who was also the one who initiated the revolt because he was a newcomer. He had just arrived um, at this colony and he was like, I'm not going to just let them beat this guy to death. Come on. And they're like, you know, we'll be very seriously punished if we do that. You can't just stand up to them. And he's like, why not? Yes, we can. <laughs> and he basically gets all of them to do this uprising. Um, and he ends up basically becoming the leader of, you know, above all of these people. And he's also a like spiritual Good. religious leader um, so everybody just kind of, you know, follows him. Um, there's also issues like, uh, one character who's very prominent in this, who becomes kind of the other, like, major, major character, uh, about halfway through the film, um, is a guy who gets kidnapped as a five-year-old. Uh, we see his mother from the very beginning of the film, she's pregnant, we see her give birth to him, there's this beautiful ritual where everybody starts, um, doing like this rhythmic clapping to kind of like help her through the labor process. Uh, once the boy is born, um, you know, they they sing basically to ask mm. um, to ask that he be watched over and protected. And do they and ask the Orishas? Yes. Okay. Um, and so uh, when when he's five, he gets kidnapped, and he ends up growing up in a in a church he's named francisco which is a you know, portuguese name um and then one day uh he decides to run away um you see him like uh take a bag that has food he leaves the cross that he was wearing behind and he just runs off and you see him trekking you know through the mountains and everything climbing um and these mountains are like very smooth like volcanic rock it's not easy to climb and there's the scene of him just like you know trying to trying to get up this and he gets to the top he finds the um the leader of these people and uh his partner and they take him in and they're just like oh my god it's you and they realize he's that kid who was kidnapped 15 years ago so he's 20 at this point um Another person um, ends up getting killed when uh, some Portuguese folks that they befriend uh, betrays him. And this guy who has returned basically says, I want to avenge him. Can I please avenge him? Give me permission to do that. So they go through this ritual um, and they give him a new name, Zumbi, and that becomes his name. So he finally has a name that is from his culture um and he becomes this warrior and they ask one of the orishas basically to teach him the way of war the wisdom um to not be afraid all of that and he ends up going and raiding these portuguese towns and freeing all of the enslaved people they're able to come join um and so he ends up becoming kind of an oppositional figure a little bit later on because he and the other leader 
disagree about what they should do because basically some of the Portuguese are like, hey, you know, if you move to this valley, we'll be friends with you. We'll let you live your lives. Just don't like help any escaped slaves. And he's just kind of like, that's 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 not really great. That's kind of messed up, actually. Let's maybe not do that. A little too on the nose for what's happening right now in real life. A little too <laughs> on the nose. Yes, God. And this was made in 1984 and yeah. is set. And, and this is based on historic events. You know, yeah. it's not yeah. like a one to one perfect historic depiction. But well, it's... you know, enslavement, genocide, you know, stuff that never goes out of style, apparently. I mean, oh, God. Yeah, uh... no. Um. So, uh, so the, uh, the, the, the kind of original leader of these people, um, says, okay, well, let's go to the valley. Let's see if we can do this. You know, like this war is terrible. We need it to end. We need the conflict to end. Otherwise we can't grow as a people. So some people decide to follow him. Some people decide to follow this new guy, Zumbi, and they stay there, um, in the mountains. Because they're like, we're not budging. This is our home, you know. Uh, and also one line that um, Zumbi says that I really love is, uh, I'm paraphrasing here because I don't want to like look in my notes until I find it. But he basically says something to the effect of like, they can't give me what I already have, which is my freedom. Um, and uh, so... Some of them uh, go to the valley, some of them stay in the mountains. It's basically each um, each village within uh, Palmarius makes that decision. Each leader makes that decision on whether to stay or go. Mm -hmm. uh, those who go to the valley get there, and guess what? The Portuguese are waiting for them. Surprise, surprise. Uh, and the guy that's kind of leading that unit basically is like, hey, Zumbi stayed in the mountains. You got to convince him to come down to the valley or the deal is null, basically. And, you know, he's like, I, I can't control what he does. That's that's not reasonable. Mm -hmm. um, but as he stays there, he realizes, OK, no, he was right. These guys are not our friends. They're not going to actually uphold what they said. And he ends up um, basically sacrificing himself in order to convince people to go back. Um, he's, uh, poisoned, he ends up dying, and, uh, basically they frame this Portuguese guy, um, who was in the group and make it look like he did it, but then, um, one of the other characters says, he did that to himself, didn't he? And, um, they end up leading the people back. So, conflict continues, um, some more time passes, this is over again a few decades, hmm. and, Ultimately, they do end up having to fight. Um, you know, there there is no avoiding that because the Portuguese want to wipe out this opposition. Um, they want access to all of the land. They don't want these people who are what they see as an exploitable labor source to go on living and have this community and this freedom. Um, ultimately, um, Zimbi does end up getting killed, uh, tragically, and eventually, you know, this community does, does not last forever. But um, in kind of the epilogue to the movie where they put more historical context on the screen at the end, they talk about how even though um, they continued this resistance and it didn't, you know, stick, it was a very important thing historically. And it also inspired um, people to keep on fighting. Mm -hmm. And the reason that I really wanted to talk about this film is I haven't been to Brazil, but I have been to Peru and I've been to Ecuador in South America. And you hear stories like this all the time there, um, both for formerly enslaved African people and formerly enslaved indigenous people, because that's something that a lot of people from the United States don't know because we associate um, specifically slavery with the transatlantic slave trade, um, because that's what the English and the Dutch and the Germans and the French all did. But the Portuguese um, and especially the Spanish also enslaved indigenous people. So you hear that with communities of people from Africa and people from, you know, from this hemisphere escaping um, servitude and forming these communities. Some of them still exist, mm. which is incredible. Um, one that I've been to actually in Peru, if you go to Lake Titicaca, there's this one community of people that, um, they escaped a silver mine and they built these floating islands that they still live on made out of reeds. It is the coolest place. Um, and you get to hear them tell the story of how their ancestors got there. And it is phenomenal. Um, 
also just getting to see the similarities um, between the people of Palmares and then people in Black communities that I visited um, on the coast of Ecuador who were brought there for the same reason. It's it's sugarcane because that was the really big um, purpose of importing enslaved people was they wanted the sugar harvest. So I see a lot of a lot of just similarities because it's people from the same cultures um, in Africa being brought over, even though it's and they end up in different places on the South American continent. Right. Um, there are so many similarities. You see the Orishas and all these different cultures. Um, you see the spiritual traditions, the culture, uh, the music, the dance. There's a lot of like really just beautiful cultural depictions in this Afro film. Latin and it is amazing. Yes, God. Yes. I love it. I love it. Um, there's one community uh, in Ecuador that I really love. Um, in uh, the area is called Esmeraldas. Uh, there's both a city and a like state within the country by that name. Um, and it's overwhelmingly majority black. And you go there and you get to see um, all of these cultural practices. Uh, they have like youth groups that learn traditional music and dance and everything. And they're just really phenomenal groups of people. And so getting to see this really important film and be able to compare that to people I've met and talked to and, you know, like listen to their stories and, and seen bits of their culture is just a really cool experience. And this is one of those films that I feel like everybody should watch, um, especially if you don't have the means to travel like that, because that's the best you can get without actually going to these places and hearing it directly. Um, so really, really incredible film. I, I truly cannot recommend this one enough. I'd never heard of it. And what year did it come out? 1984. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. I'm, I'm mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, so Quilombo. Um, very important Brazilian film. Very important Latin American film. Really, I, really I, good. I, my knowledge really in good. that area is kind of scant for film is really kind of scant I, I have to admit. i have a feeling that i'm probably the biggest latino file in this group so that's why i try to keep on finding stuff um from latin american countries because i really want that part yeah. of the world to get representation yeah sure um and, and, and i saw it's... the motorcycle diaries that's a good film what is it you just what the motorcycle diaries um che Guevara. yes 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 that's yes good. yes i that's love really... that film <laughs> absolutely love that one that is one of my favorites i've seen that maybe like four or five times who, play, I, who plays che Guevara? is that gail garcia it is mm -hmm. yeah yep oh yeah that's my man the werewolf i love him he's i love also him so great much. In and he is, he is phenomenal in that yeah, like i love man. the motorcycle diaries yeah that's that's a great one that's too have a, have a serious message but it's also quite comedic in a lot of parts as well it is it is i actually this, this, this <laughs> there's there's this one part where so it's it's che Guevara and his best friend um going on basically a cross-continental road trip on a motorcycle and also yeah. on foot because of course the motorcycle dies of course mm. it does um, you know, you're going up in the mountains on this thing. It's it's not going to make it. Uh, but there's this one point where they get to the Amazon River and Che is just like, all right, I'm going to swim across. And his best friend is shouting him like, no, you idiot. You're going to get yourself killed. I showed this movie to my best friend. And I was just like, hey, hey, that's us. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's a good, it's like a buddy movie, but it's also incredibly political. Anyway, this is such a tangent because this has nothing to I, do with Black Cinema. But God, I love that movie. I no, I, I remember. I remember so when it came out. It was it was <laughs> it was a pretty good seller at Borders. When, and it, it is really I, good. That's where I first heard of that actor. But uh, yeah. I, I I will I will echo what uh, what Bill said about Marvel is that for all their failings, currently they have brilliant casting directors. So, you know, it would think, oh, Gail Garcia Bernal is Werewolf by Night. And it's yeah. brilliant. It's incredible. You know, his he's, name in, Jack... he's in a lot of films. And, and his I name's just... Jack Russell. Everything they he's in, I'm just like, name. is that, is that who I think of? Yeah. Yeah. Hey, I love him. He's such a good actor. <laughs> um, um, hello. Can I, I'm sorry, can I jump in? Yes, of course. I'm going to have to go because I've got to get up at four in the morning. Oh, gosh. To go to, go oh, to work. Okay. And I know you'll edit this out, but I'm like, kind of falling asleep because that's i'm okay. very tired that's okay. yeah and i know i have like one more thing one more movie but um i shall return maybe uh, you can make it next be... week i mean uh yes, 17th oh, oh, oh well you're well aren't you doing something on the 10th well we changed no? it because i've got to finish moving next oh. weekend so, oh, so you moved so... it to the 17th mm -hmm. no no i'm moving that... until the t i'm moving until the 12th 
So I, I don't. Want, this is the last thing I'll be able to record at this house. Oh, mm -hmm. I understand. Yeah. Okay. Henry's okay. gonna have a new background. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Good. I'm happy. But, uh, okay. So, but, so the seventeenth will be part two of Black Center. Yes. So if you can, oh, if you can join us for that, we'd love to have you. And I would you know to more topics that. in the future too. Okay. Like this was great. Yeah. I want to talk. I mean, you're talking about Arisha. I grew up in the Yoruba culture. I know oh, cool, about, cool, cool. You know uh -huh. about Potun and Chango and you know Batala and I mean that's so all I can. I but I'm learn just more about this stuff. I'm very, very tired. I'm so sorry, but I really understandable. But I would yeah. love to hear your insights on all of that cultural stuff. Like that was that's awesome. Oh, sure, yeah. sure, totally. It's it's the real deal. That's all I can say. But um, yeah, but it was so great meeting all of you. Really, I enjoyed yeah. it thoroughly. So. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you we'll so much for joining now. us. Oh, okay, you're very welcome. Have a great night. Uh, you too. Take Good care. Night. Bye. Bye. Take it easy. And I feel her on that because the only reason I'm awake right now is because I have all of this caffeine. Well, Justin may not have much longer, so do you want to do your second one now, Justin? Yeah, I'm happy to do that. And I've got the advantage of it being in the morning here, so I'm not so tired. Oh, okay. It's 1019 at night here. <laughs> Woo yeah, it's 1219 just after midday here, so that's all completely out. You know? It's so yeah. different. Uh, anyway. Um, he's he's going to so pep up the show. Is the film for... <laughs> The, the second film is a Tarantino film that for people who aren't at heart are not Tarantino fans. Yeah, but don't but... Hard the, hold that against Justin. He is a cool guy. <laughs> oh, yeah. Thank you for that. Tarantino's yeah. not um, allowed yeah. on this channel, but I made an exception because I love that movie. And I know yeah, you yeah. do a good okay. job. Well, yeah. well, I actually yeah. read something from Roger Ebert or someone, and they said it's a Tarantino film that's people's favorite Tarantino film if they're not really into Tarantino. At heart, which is and you know, you know what he does, Karen. Karen yeah. What he says about that movie, it's the same thing so many directors do of movies I love. Like Dario Argento hates Cat of Nine Tales, but that's my favorite Dario Argento movie by far. Mm -hmm. And then Jackie Brown, Tarantino despises that movie. He's like, I hate it. I should have never wow. made that trash. And one time he even yeah. said, somebody asked him, they said, Why do you hate it? He said, because I didn't let myself act in it. I think that enhances my films. I'm like, oh my, oh god. my god. Talk about unself aware. So full of himself. Jeez. <laughs> so go ahead and tell us about this accidentally great film. <laughs> well, it, it's a great it's a great film, but he, Tarantino was actually heavily criticized by Spike Lee for a particular I know they have a feud over it, yeah. A particular part of that film, which I'll I'll mention in passing, but um, yes, it's Jackie Brown. Um, I mention it because it's, um, I think, the starring role is Pam Greer. Yeah, there you and go. And it's a bit of a homage to um, black exploitation, black exploitation films from the um, 1970s. In particular, there's a film, uh, I believe, uh, Foxy Brown, which stars Pam Greer from, which I, I covered the on the Woman Warrior show. Mm -hmm. so it's yeah, been yeah. On this channel. yeah, 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 cool. yeah. So, um, so she plays Pam Greer plays a titular um, Jackie Brown, who's a flight attendant. Uh, she knows a uh, an associate, shady associate, Odell, who is played by Samuel L. Jackson, who is trying to um, have some profits from gun running brought into the U.S. from Mexico. And Jackie, as a flight attendant, is in charge of doing that, but she's caught in, in, in bringing that into the airport. Um, and a, a bail bondsman uh, known as Max Cherry, played by Robert Forster, um, is asked by That's Odell to... Uh, to uh, um, basically cover her bail, so to speak. So I think central to the movie is the relationship that evolves between Max Cherry, mm -hmm. one of my favorite uh, characters in films. Me too. And, um, and uh, yeah, and he's great, isn't he? And, um, and Pam Greer's character with Jackie Brown. Um, so there's a bit of a convoluted plot in it. Um, but before I mention that, there's a number of quite well-known actors in this film. There's uh, Michael Keaton, who I believe is a law enforcement agent, it's a while since I've seen the film. No, you're right. Um, Robert De Niro's in there as Lewis, who's an associate of Odell, who's sort of in a drug-induced haze most of the time and extremely sort of violent character. Um, <laughs> but he plays second fiddle to um, throughout most of the film to Samuel L. Jackson's character. Uh, Bridget Fonda is also, um, I think, the girlfriend of Odell. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, so they, Pam Greer's character comes up with an idea to try and hoodwink Odell and basically keep the profits for herself. And she um, decides to cut Max Cherry into it as part of the deal. So he'll take a cut of the fact that she's going to try and keep the money for herself. 
Um, and there's a very convoluted plot involving the law enforcement, uh, Jackie Brown, uh, and so the so-called villains of the piece as well, um, involving a change of money, I think, at this shopping center in a, in a, in a changing room of a clothes store towards the end of the film. Um, <laughs> It doesn't have necessarily cartoonish violence like a lot of Tarantino films do, like Reservoir Dogs or Pulp Fiction. Um, That's lot, probably yeah, also why he hates it. Yeah, yeah. It's not like a usual Tarantino film. There's not all the pop culture references. And when mm -hmm. I was about 25, I quite liked, I, I, I did like Pulp Fiction, but I think if I saw it now, I'd probably have a different take. Um, so, uh, <laughs> I've been on that journey, There's a little man. bit of violence. There's I still have a little also bit of been on that journey. Here. <laughs> yeah, there's a bit of violence in it because there's um, a very shocking scene at one point where Robert De Niro's character shoots another character in the stomach, uh, played by Bridget Fonda. It's not even uh, graphic, no... but it's so ex intense. Well, it's a sort of a standout for me because I was shocked when it happened because you don't yeah. really expect it. They were just sort of having a, a conversation as he's driving a van in a car park, and she kind of innocently um, taunts him about his bad driving and the fact he hasn't managed to find a car park. And next thing you know, he's turned around and shot her, and that's that's the end of her character. So, so the fact that it happened so suddenly yeah. is kind of like a, it's a jarring note in the film, um, and um, yeah, there's so there's a little bit of violence in it, but not to the same extent as most Tarantino films, um, and uh, there's a happy ending, so to speak, at the end. Um, Spike Lee, as I mentioned before, although it's very well lauded by the critics as film, and it gets good cinema scores for the audience and critics. Um, I think uh, one of the critics said it was, or well, might have been Roger Ebert, said it was one of his best films of 1997, which yeah. is when the film was released. Yep. Um, but Spike Lee took exception to the use of the N-word um, during the film, and uh, apparently this is something that Tarantino does quite a bit. Yeah. Um, no I was going to no say, all he did with that criticism was double down and use it a whole bunch more in additional films, so there's that. Yeah. 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 Yeah, so I used it. I think Spike Lee had a good point, actually. But um, so yeah. it's, it's used something like thirty eight time, thirty eight times yeah. in the movies. It's like we don't know and the point. so, uh, and I think Tarantino. I don't know what sort of point he was trying to make, but anyway, uh, that's what he did. Um, but Being an I entitled said, white guy who really wants to be able to use slurs for honestly well, no good reason. Well, within that story, in that context, well, to, to, said, to be I'm fair. Sure. To be fair, within the context of that Elmore Leonard novel and that story where he's yeah. trying to replicate the 70s, mm -hmm. I mean, Pam Greer says nigga several times in her mo each one of her movies. Nobody bats it and batted an eyelash, I guess, because that was people liked that word back then because it was offensive. Now they hate it for good reasons. Uh, for very good reasons. But if you watch old black exploitation movies, you'll see, you'll see people on the street, black people talking to each other, and they're like, hey, nigga. Now there's a lot of black people who hate that. And of course, mm -hmm. I have no skin in the game because I'm not black. So it's just to me yeah. an offensive word. But I think yeah, um, Tarantino unfortunately has no skin in the game either. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly. the point. That's the point. Point. There. That's <laughs> right there. Good point. <laughs> Excellent. Yeah. yeah. So as I say, the, the the real heart of the film is the relationship between Jackie Brown and, and Max Cherry, mm -hmm. and Max kind of coolly uh, he listens to a lot of. Uh, 60s and 70s black music, Bobby Womack and so forth. Oh, and he tends to go to him on his own to the uh, the shopping complex and go to movies on his own and this kind of thing. So he's just one of my favorite I can empathize. characters in the last 20 years or so, 30 years or so. Um, and uh, yeah, so I just thought I'd mention that as a film. I'm, most people have probably seen it, uh, but if you haven't seen it, I'll, I'll suggest checking it out. Um, it, as I say, it's a bit of an ode to black exploitation from the 70s which i'm quite into uh, in terms of a genre um and uh yeah there you go it's a it's, a, it's certainly Fantastic. in my view the, the only real tarantino film i i still enjoy i think me too and and the thing is I, I enjoy it a lot that's that's just crazy it's like you know it's like i don't know um mm -hmm. thank you that was excellent i agree with you mm -hmm. and uh speaking of those classic movies uh chuck is going to talk about one that basically Picked off the whole whole cycle of them, correct? Wow. Yeah, uh, yeah, that's right. Okay, so first of all, as a quick tangent, uh, okay, yeah. my own ba Baron Samity story, which uh, yeah. speaking of the uh, the aforementioned friend group uh, who turned me on to Dolomite, uh, one of those one of those individuals, in fact, probably the one who was most 
uh, responsible for getting me into that. Uh, had a Baron Samity pendant, and uh, he he had that around, and he kept trying to get rid of it, or he kept losing it. Whatever he did, it kept turning up again, almost like a monkey paw or something. It kept oh God. Turning up. I think eventually he did a uh, he did a book called uh, called the Christ of all flat tires and uh, <laughs> and it was just the image of that Baron Samity pendant. Oh wow, that's the truth. And uh, so interesting little side note. Yeah, there. very cool. <laughs>